Let's get ready to get started here. You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Vinny. I appreciate it. Hey, y'all, welcome. Um, I'm excited for I'm excited for this panel. I'm Abby. I'll quickly introduce myself to start, and then we have an incredible array of panelists here today to talk to you all about fundraising for your initiatives. So, Abby, I lead marketing and growth at Donors Choose. Donors Choose is the number one crowdfunding platform for U.S. public school teachers to help them get funding and resources for their classrooms. And our organization is fully focused on educational equity. In the 20 years that we've existed, we've helped to fund hundreds of thousands of classrooms and teachers, getting everything from computers to books to rugs into those classrooms across the U.S. And we've raised over a million, um, over a billion, over a billion dollars for those classrooms. My role on the team Thank you. My role on the team is to raise half of that funding every single year. So my team raises $80 million a year for public school classrooms. We engage over 600,000 supporters through our website to make donations to those classrooms and those specific schools. And we work with teachers to make sure that they're able to use our platform to um, vocalize the needs for their students and to make a resounding impact on um, their individual classrooms, but also um, stay in the classroom and feel happy with the classroom that they're teaching in. So I have a lot of expertise here in both raising money from individual donors myself, but also coaching teachers on doing that. And um, previous to Donors Choose, I worked at Etsy, working with sellers to coach those entrepreneurs, those artisans, on how to raise money for their um, ventures and get started with their shops on the site. So really excited to be here. And before I introduce all of you to our panelists, um, I have the privilege of getting to introduce one of the commitment makers who are part of CGIU today. So I'm thrilled to welcome M. Vang of Berkeley College of Music to the stage. So M, come over here. I'm gonna come, come on up. I'm gonna brag on you a little bit to the group. So um, M has identified a challenge and that challenge is that the entertainment industry has historically and continues to exclude and marginalize artists who are female, BIMPOC, non-binary, LGBTQ, and those who have and identify with having a disability, among other groups. M imagines a world where there's a standard measurement, something that they call the waveability score, that would help all of us hold arts organizations accountable for diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. So imagine if you're buying a ticket to see a show, you might be able to understand if that organization or that theater had practices that included diversity, equity, and inclusion practices, and if they didn't, to consider that as part of your choice as a consumer. Um, we're um, privileged to be up here with you today. I know you wanted to say a quick thank you, and then um, I'll give you the certificate and we can take a quick photo. Come on over. I just. Thank you so much. I just want to say uh, thank you to CGIU, Tiki, for bringing non-binary people into this community, um, of which I am now part of, and I'm so grateful. Thank you, Rebecca Autumn Sansom, and Shira Gaines uh, from the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment for being our sponsor, our main funder uh, for the last two years. Thank you. Round of applause for um, all right. All right, we'll try this for a second time. You can all hear me? Fantastic. Okay, so um, you are here for a very important topic, which is fundraising for your big idea. And I might argue that it's one of the most important topics that we're covering at this CGI University event, knowing that if you're trying to make big change, right, you need backers to help make that change. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our, our panelists. And as I call you, you can come up and take your seat on the stage. And then I'll introduce the topic at hand. I'll ask a series of questions and then make sure you're thinking about your questions throughout because I'll be open up the floor at the end for you all to ask your questions. And we may, thanks to a fantastic idea by Brandon, actually ask one of you to come up and make a pitch 
for your idea and give you some feedback on it. So if you're eager for that, think about if you might want to come up. All right, let's start with Vinny Joel. Vinny was a CGIU 2010 graduate and continues to be a mentor for the program. She has guided hundreds, she said even probably close to a thousand CGIU graduates as they fundraise for their ideas. Vinny spent the last 10 years of her career working in leadership roles in healthcare, with the last seven years managing a large business and advocating for patient rights as a member of the team at Kaiser Permanente. She is an experienced fundraiser who I know will provide valuable insight to all of you today. Welcome, Vinny. Thank you. Let's give Vinny a round of applause. Thank you. I'll move on now to Dr. Victoria De Francesco Soto, Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service at the University of Arkansas. She's also a political analyst for MSNBC, NBC News, and Telemundo, both in English and in Spanish. Vicky, as she told me to call her, yeah. is the first Latina dean at a presidential institution, and she was named one of the top 12 scholars in the country by Diverse Magazine. <laughs> Victoria, or Vicky, previously taught at Northwestern University and Rutgers, and she received her PhD in political science, where she focuses on civic engagement, women, immigration, Latinos, and political psychology. So welcome to the stage. Awesome. And last but not least is Brandon Andrews, who's an entrepreneur, a business leader, and an experienced marketer who's committed to bringing resources to diverse entrepreneurs. Brandon is currently the CEO of Gage, an AI marketing research firm focused on helping brands shape their ideas with input from a representative set of stakeholders. Brandon has also led a nationwide casting tour focused on bringing more diverse ideas and voices to ABC's Shark Tank. So you can see why he had that idea for our pitch. And he was named a Global Innovation Fellow by the US Department of State. And he's traveled the world speaking on entrepreneurship and innovation. And I also find out, found out when I was researching that he was a Division I track athlete, which I found a little bit intimidating when I was, when I was coming up here. If anyone wants to learn how to triple jump, I'll, I'll, I'll do lessons at the track after. Okay, I think we have a lot of different plans for, for this event. It could go a lot of different directions, but we will make sure to get you some, some good advice about fundraising. So let me introduce the topic at hand, and then we'll kick off with some questions to this incredible group of folks. Um, so today, we're talking about fundraising for your big idea, and if you're here, it's because you're trying to learn how to navigate whether traditional grant-based fundraising streams um, online fundraising tools, social media, or other digital marketing to further your big idea. And it's an interesting time for fundraising, like so many other industries, right? Things have been affected by what's happened in the world, in this country, over the last three years. Um, there was a big boom in folks participating in social good, both from a volunteerism and from a giving perspective during the pandemic. And it's partially in our hands to kind of keep that interest alive in the great issues that we still have in this world um, after that period of time. And it still remains to be seen whether we can. Um, like so many industries, there's been a huge shift to digital, um, whether platforms for online events, even you can see this event, right, what's happening this year, um, as well as a move towards thinking about younger generations of donors. Historically, we've relied a lot on the wealth of baby boomers as a part of giving. And as we see millennials and Gen Z really take their own, um, enter their own way into the field of giving back, um, the dynamics change. And the way that folks want to be spoken to, the way they want to be engaged start to shift. So excited to talk to this group, both about the sources of funding, but also how to pitch, what you need to make a compelling pitch. So we'll have time for, for a lot of different questions. All right, so we're gonna dive in. And Vinny, I'll start with you, so I'll start with a question that I'll have each of you answer, which is, based on your experience, what are some recent trends you're seeing in entrepreneurship and fundraising? And what are some of the unique challenges that you see entrepreneurs and change makers facing today as they try to raise funds for their big ideas? You know, one of the trends that I see currently is that innovation and creativity is really changing the way that we raise funds. 
things that are working today in the fundraising world were things that five or 10 years ago, fundraisers would have looked at you and said, wait, you're gonna try what? That's not gonna work. And what we're learning is, is that there's not one way to raise funds. There's not one platform. There's not a traditional method of raising funds. You can raise funds and get money from lots of different sources. And the more creative and engaging your fundraising strategies are, the better that is. I think as far as challenges, especially when it comes to fundraising, is right now if you wanna say we're in an economic downturn, an economic recession, really what that means is people have less disposable income. They have less money to give to your commitments. And I think what's really important now is to look at, it's not always making sure that you get a million dollars or you've got donors that are gonna give you $100 at a time. It's more cultivating your donors and the relationships that you have with your donors. And I think that's really important. One of the things that I think will really lead to longevity in your fundraising, um, as well as creating a donor base, is how do you interact with your donors and how do you interact with them often? So that's probably one of the biggest challenges I see right now is people don't have enough discretionary income to be supporting you, but also from a fundraising perspective, not all nonprofits are doing a good job of creating connections with their donors and creating a relationship so that when they do have more disposable income, they think of you first. That's such great advice. And a huge part of that, right, is just finding that community of people who care about what you care about and what you're trying Absolutely. to do. Yeah, Vicki, go ahead. So I think a key challenge is mapping out your ask. And I'm going to wonk out on you a bit. And I want you all to think about M&E, measurement and evaluation. Because you can have this great idea that you're going to be seeking funding for, that you're going to be making the pitch for. But while you're thinking about all of the cool stuff that goes with that idea, think about how you're going to operationalize it. Think about how you're going to measure it because you have that seed of the idea. And maybe some people will believe in you just because of who you are. But at the end of the day, you need to marshal evidence. Right? Your funders want a return on investment. How do you do that? What are you measuring? If you're doing healthcare work, public healthcare work, how are you measuring the outcomes of these folks? And so it has to be done in a systematic way, especially as you start to scale that up. I know it's boring. I know it's not sexy. But when we're thinking about really having longevity in the projects that you are putting forward, I want you to think about that. And in terms of a particular challenge, this is something that I think a lot about. The positive is that funders are now centering DE&I more and more. Okay, so it's a good thing. There's still a ways to go, but at least it's, it's, it's front and center. The tough part is how do you measure it? How do you measure diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I mean, I'm talking about the big foundations, the Gates and the Waltons, and they themselves are having trouble in figuring out how to do that. So I think that as a potential uh, funding project, if you can answer those questions up front and let them know, this is my plan of how I'm gonna do that, that is gonna put you ahead of the game and really meet a challenge that I think that we're facing across the board in, in the development world. So, oh, go ahead. No, that's great. And I was gonna say, Vicki, I'm gonna ask you for some more examples there for folks, especially for people just getting started, because I know that the idea of a systemic way to measure things from the beginning might feel completely new to folks, so I'll come back to you on that. And Brandon, I'll It's not scary, I promise. <laughs> okay, we'll demystify it. Go ahead. And as someone who, uh, who helps to run a market research company, I definitely agree you have to measure everything. It's incredibly important. Uh, one quick correction, though. I'm the co-founder, chief product officer of Gage, not the CEO, Joshua Dubois. My friend is, uh, is, our, is our CEO, but of course, we work closely together. Um, let me begin with trends. So... Entrepreneurship in the U.S. Um, is more popular than ever. Um, I like to think shows like Shark Tank have a little bit um, to do with it, uh, in addition to some of the barriers to entry being lowered. Um, but a lot of people would be surprised to hear that the rate of entrepreneurship actually in the U.S. has been largely down since the mid-'70s. And there was actually a point um, after the... Uh, great recession after the economic crisis in 2008, 2009, where there were more businesses in the U.S. closing every year than opening. We saw an uptick pre-pandemic, 
uh, where more businesses were beginning to open and we started to see some of that economic dynamism that's so important for a healthy economy. But then the pandemic happened and you have 30% of small businesses that are closing. But we, cut, we counter that with PPP and a range of local, state, federal government programs focused on helping to keep businesses' doors open, but also injecting capital into households so that people are, you know, like, you know, I'm at home and the world might be ending. I have this dream. I might as well give it a shot with this extra money that I have in my pocket. Um, and so the result of that has been the U.S. Census Bureau reported uh, just last month or just in January that 2021 and 2022 are the most prolific two-year period ever for business formation in U.S. history. So 10 and a half million new business applications filed in that two-year period. Now, those federal government numbers are backed up by the private sector, Yelp. Everybody's seen Yelp and done Yelp reviews. Yelp in January reported that 2022, it saw the most new business listings on its platform ever in the history of the platform. And so the trend now is people are starting businesses. And so the question is, how do we get capital to businesses to meet the moment? So what kind of businesses are people starting? Most of the businesses people are starting are online micro businesses. And so those are businesses that have a working website and that are doing selling some kind of product or service or advertising online. In 2020, we saw 2.8 million more micro businesses started than in 2019 because of that pandemic bump, and we've seen that trend continue. Not only have we seen the trend in micro businesses, but who's starting the micro businesses? We see women, 57% of those micro, new micro businesses are started by women, and we see people of color, 26% of those new micro businesses have been started just by the black community alone. And if you go through other communities, um, there's similar over indexing as compared to um, percentages of the, of the US population. And so people are starting businesses, um, communities that have historically been um, socioeconomically disadvantaged are starting businesses. And so the ground is kind of set for potentially closing the wealth gap if we can get them the resources that they need. So the question is, what do micro businesses need from a funding standpoint? Do they need equity investment? Do they need grants? Do they need loans? Do they need lines of credit from a CDFI? Um, I know we'll have some time to talk about all of that, but I think the, tr the trend is, and hopefully all of you in this room will continue this trend, is people having a dream, stepping out on faith, starting the business, and now I think it's up to government and up to the foundation world to make sure that the resources are meeting the moment for where we're at versus meeting what's maybe historically been done from a funding standpoint. Such great points, Brandon. I actually wanna um, jump into something in, that you just mentioned, which is that the financing levers may need to change, but for this group, it might be really helpful to hear what financing options exist today that they might be able to consider for um, what they're trying to start. So I'd love to start with you on that question. And then Vicki, I think you may have a different perspective from your work there as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with Shark Tank. Shark Tank, we, I say we, it's not my money. Shark Tank, the sharks are largely doing equity deals. And so that is an entrepreneur coming to a potential investor and saying, I'm willing to trade this percentage of my business for a certain amount of money that's going to value my business at a certain level. So if you as an entrepreneur say, hey Shark, I have this great business, um, I'm willing to uh, trade 10% equity for $100,000, that means you're valuing the business at a million dollars. That's how basically how the deals on Shark Tank work. Um, equity investment um, is an opportunity for entrepreneurs um, but it's always been a very small percentage of entrepreneurs that get equity investments, and that's black, white, male, female, whatever, um, over the history of, of equity investments being tracked. Um, equity investments are there, and I think it's great that Shark Tank gives a window, opens up a window into that world. However, there's so many other options available to you as an entrepreneur. So the first source of capital is the human capital. It's going to be the sweat equity that you're putting in 
and your team is putting in to start the business. The second source is going to be capital or fundraising that comes directly from you. So likely the money that you need to actually file the business license, to get a trademark, uh, to make sure you have your DBA set up. All of those pieces are going to come from you personally, although some places will have grant programs available to help um, at offset some of those costs. Um, the next thing to look at is certainly grants. So grants can come from the foundation world. Grants can come from government, whether that's local, state, or federal government. Uh, after grants, um, you have to think about, is my business generating revenue? If the business is generating revenue and you can support loan payments, then potentially having a loan or taking out a line of credit um, at a financial institution, whether that's a neo bank or whether that's a CDFI, a, a community-focused bank, or whether that's a traditional big bank, those options are there for you. Um, after you take a look at what those um, grant and loan options are, if you're looking at scaling your business, maybe you go back to equity at that point and say, maybe there's angel investors, so individuals or groups of individuals who would invest in your company, again, trading a percentage of the company for an amount of investment. Um, or um, once you move past a certain level of traction, um, there are what's called institutional investors. And that's when we get into venture capitalists, VC funds, um, that would be investing likely larger sums of money into your business and potentially you know, trading it for, for larger amounts of equity. You go through successive rounds of funding if you're on a traditional venture track from your pre-seed, seed, post-seed, post and then you get into your series rounds all the way until you really hit it big and decide to IPO, so list your business on the public market where you would have a listing on something like the New York Stock Exchange where the public can buy stock in your business and that will enable you to be able to continue to fund the company from there. So that's a quick overview. Thank you, that was fantastic. And just to engage the audience here, how many of you have already raised some money for the big idea that you're aiming to launch? Okay, y'all, look around you, because you should ask these folks for advice after this as well. And then how many people in the room are, are looking to raise more money or money for their ventures? Okay, okay, amazing. So Vicki, I think you may have a perspective even on the earlier yes. phases of um, when folks are still trying to figure out what their idea is, figure out that concept, figure out how to measure it. So why don't you jump in? Yes, and I'm, and I'm gonna bring a slightly different lens than Brandon's. I think um, the work I have done in, in the academy, but also in working closely with nonprofits at the Clinton School of Public Service, that's we engage big ideas through a lot of nonprofit work. Um, it's through foundations, but that's this huge catch-all, right? The foundations. And I, I do want to break that down a little bit because I do think it is a lot more accessible that you might think of at first blush, right? So they're the big ones, the, the names that everybody knows. But I think that there is a missed opportunity with mid-level foundations, these family foundations that may not give out those multi-million dollar grants for your, for your big idea, but can maybe help you get $50,000, $75,000, something to get started. So thinking of those family foundations, or also um, most cities and states have community foundations. I live in Arkansas, the Arkansas Community Foundation pools money from people who want to have impact in their communities, and they make calls in terms of figuring out what are projects that work best with that, right? So there's a foundation world. It's, it's a very diverse one, and it's not just a couple of big players. So a lot of it, this is do your research. The other thing I want you all to consider, and I know we have a diverse group in terms of what your interests are, uh, is partnering with universities or academics. So in figuring out, can I work with someone, somebody who's doing research on food sustainability, and your interest is in building out the sector or the environment, is finding if someone shares that and they can provide some of the research, but also with research comes funding, right? Funding, whether, again, from the foundations, but also the government, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health. There's a whole bunch of acronyms I could throw out, but it's money that is coming through the federal government, sometimes through the state government, and at times also through state governments, if you're looking at public institutions. So look around. 
try to find a match. And, and, and maybe the money won't be there immediately, but you start to build this network where it's in your area of interest and they can help you leverage those resources at a different point in time when you are ready to scale up your, your idea. Thank you for that. And I do think, um, I'll add on, you can do a lot of research right online to see how other social ventures and newer social ventures were funded. That's a great place yeah. to start to find those names of foundations, universities, um, or even individuals or accelerators that are looking to invest in new ideas for social change. Abby, let me, let me just add in here that a lot of times your public libraries will have the databases of all of the foundations from the big ones to the little ones and they will know what projects they give to so that way you're not just blindly asking but you're like oh this this foundation the logan foundation they really like stem education with a focus on ai so that is someone that you're going to make that match with so do the homework and a lot of times it's readily accessible and free to you that's great. Yeah, and even donors choose, right? We've been around for 20 years. We raise a billion dollars for classrooms, but we'll research um, what other, you know, education organizations, who are their funders, right? Who are they getting money from? Should we approach those folks? So there's a lot of research you can do there to start to build um, a set of folks you at least want to talk to, right? Even if you're not ready to ask for funds. Vinny, you alluded a lot to relationship building in that first answer. Can you tell us a bit more about your, um, how you approach relationship building and how you guide other CGIU participants and graduates to approach relationship building? Absolutely, I think in fundraising, in in anything that you do in life, the relationships are key. If you don't have those relationships, you're not gonna get anywhere. Whether it be moving forward on your commitment to action or getting funds, one of the most important things to know is who are your donors? Uh, you mentioned earlier about data. I am not a data person. I hate data. I don't like collecting it. I don't like looking at it. I don't always understand it. But you have to do it because you're going to find donors. They want to see your data. They want to see, and some donors really want to know, what is your impact? I'm not going to give you a dollar until I know that you're impactful. And when it comes to really cultivating relationships, I think the most important thing is, is to be genuine. Right? Find your people. Who wants to commit to your cause? Who wants to give their money to your cause? And what is the best way to communicate with them? One of the things I tell a lot of my students and my, my mentees as we move forward in the process is, how are you going to keep the people connected to your work? So just because I give you $100, are you going to let me go and just never talk to me again and be really excited over the $100 or $1,000 or $10,000? Yeah, you should be really excited, but stay in contact with me. Get my email, get my mailing address, snail mail me a card once a year. Um, really remind me of the work that you're doing and the impact that your work has. And also just stay connected, especially when you guys are in positions where you're just starting out and you're just starting to get your donors, pick up the phone, ask them what they wanna see from you. Ask them for feedback. What could I be doing better from your perspective? What would you like to see me doing more of? Be careful when you take that information from them, take it with a grain of salt but stay connected. And then also, one of the organizations that I actually worked for was St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. They are what I believe to be one of the greatest fundraising operations in the world. They really work on cultivating donors from the get-go. So they actually have a program where they cultivate their donors in preschool through the Trikathon program. So little kids go out and they learn about cancer um, and they learn about tricycle safety and they get donations to help the kids at St. Jude. The next program is the St. Jude Mathathon where it engages um, elementary school students and there's programs for high schools and college and to continue on, but that's definitely a market that I think sometimes we forget about. Um, but it really starts with cultivating donors as early as possible. And I think they just do a great model of that. So I don't work there anymore, always support them. They do great work, but check out how they're raising funds. It's really amazing. I wanna talk about a couple of different stages of what you just mentioned. So the first one, right, is writing a good email, getting a good introduction. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I can add that from our end, short, sweet, direct, to the point. Would love to hear other tips from this group around that stage. And then I think let's get a bit more into the questions that we should ask folks, right? Because one of the greatest sales strategies is understanding what the person you're talking to cares about not sharing what you care about. So let's start with what you tell them, and then I would love to hear more about questions. So if anyone uh, wants to jump in on advice there. 
what makes a great email, what makes a great pitch. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start, and I'll, I'll say I, I, I don't start in, in preschool. However, downstream development for me from a Shark Tank casting perspective is incredibly important, and I'm always happy to meet anyone who has an interest in the show. Some people will be immediately competitive, and we do always have entrepreneurs who um, submit an application and pitch and make it on the show that first time, but very often it's the second or third time before entrepreneurs make it on the show just because it's a very competitive process. And so I'm always happy to meet someone wherever they are with their level of interest, have a you know very honest conversation about uh, where they're at and whether or not they may be competitive immediately, uh, but stay in contact and doing so allows me to then build a story that I can take back to our broader team and advocate for potentially this person moving forward, whereas without that additional context, it just may not have happened. And I think that experience is mirrored, whether you're for-profit, non-profit, whether you're you know, getting an equity investment, whether you're working with a banker, whether you're in the foundation space or getting a grant. Uh, in terms of things that I'm looking for and things that investors, I think, are looking for more broadly. One, it's articulating the problem. So what problem are you solving? Two, what's the solution that you're delivering? Or how are you making people's lives better? So you know, if you have a cupcake business, you may not necessarily be solving a problem, but you're delivering happiness. And so being able to clearly articulate that. Um, what's the market opportunity? So. How big do you think this market is and how much money do you think you're going to make and how are you going to make the money? What's the market opportunity? Um, traction, which both of you um, alluded to with the KPIs and metrics, traction is going to look different for every business. So for some businesses, if you aren't capital intensive, traction can be revenue. Uh, for other businesses, let's say you're a mobile app company, it's gonna be downloads or monthly active users, weekly active users. Uh, for other businesses, it may be intellectual property. So maybe you have a patent, a provisional patent, maybe you have a trademark, um, whatever that may be. Um, however you define traction for the business, be able to tell the story of how you got from where you started to where you are today. And then finally, and most importantly, ask. Don't forget to make an appropriate ask uh, whenever you are engaging with a potential uh, funder, with a potential um, capital resource. Now, there's always the old saying that you don't want the first time you meet somebody to be asking them for something or to be asking them for money. And so if there's an opportunity to build a relationship in kind of a softer space, that's great. But even as you're building the relationship initially, you can ask them to follow you on IG or to check out your video on TikTok or to check out your YouTube page or if you have some kind of um, podcast or something, there's always an ask there that's appropriate. And one of the biggest issues that we've had at Shark Tank Casting Calls is people literally coming in, they pitch the business, cover all the pieces, and then they just leave without asking. So so um, then the whole point is to give entrepreneurs an opportunity to pitch their business. Um, don't forget to make an appropriate ask um, wherever you're at. If you can put those things together, I think you can put yourself in a position to be successful, whether you're pitching for an equity investment again or you know, pitching in some of these other spaces. Yeah, and, and asks other than money, right? If you're not ready to do that, can be for advice in something specific where you feel like they have um, a really specific perspective or connections to other folks, right? Who else should I talk to about what I'm trying to do? And if each call can propel the next and propel into that next relationship, that be, could be incredibly powerful as well. Um, any tips, Vinny or, or Vicky, around um, maybe the do's or the don'ts of things that you've seen folks do in those early conversations? Absolutely. I think one of the things, especially because, remember, I was in your seat just a few years ago and um, have continued to stay active with my commitment to action. But to remember is don't go into asking someone immediately for an, a crazy amount of money, right? A lot of times what I see students doing is saying, hey, I need a million dollars to get my commitment off the ground. And they start to share that. And I think sometimes, depending on who your donors are, that can be a little bit intimidating. So really break it down into smaller pieces. If you have a donor that's willing to give you a million dollars or you know they have the capacity to, then definitely make the ask. But if you're coming to me, don't ask me for a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. If you ask me for a hundred, maybe we can talk. Um, not everyone in the room come up and ask me for a hundred dollars today, though, please. <laughs> That's not going to happen. 
Um, but what you want to be able to do is break it down for them. Exactly, what is your money doing? Why are you here to build on your point? Why am I sending you this email? Why should you care about my project? And what is the impact that you've already made or plan to make? Um, I think the don't is don't get discouraged. When you're sending out these emails, you might send out 5,000 emails, you might do 500 pitches, and, get, and people will say no to you every time and look at you like you're crazy, and that's okay. You guys do have a really big win here, though. Just knowing that you guys got into CGIU and you have the support of CGIU and your CGIU mentors is a huge win. My commitment to action was a garden at the University of Pacific. I grew up on a farm. I really wanted kids to know about ag education. It was so important to me. When I first took the idea to the university, they said, absolutely not. Our university is beautiful. Do not come in here trying to plant vegetables on our campus. It's not gonna happen. I got accepted into CGIU. All of a sudden, everyone's tune changed. It was the president of the university coming to me saying, hey, what did you just go do in Miami? Um, tell me more. How can we support you? It was the Board of Regents who, super grateful to Walter Robb, who was the CEO of Whole Foods at the time, took a liking to my project, ended up giving me my initial funding. But I remember in the early days of me trying to get my commitment off the ground, the dean of the business school, I was working on my MBA, calling me in and saying, quit playing in the dirt. Your grades are suffering. This is what you need to focus on. And my grades were suffering, like they weren't so great. We had a data and decisions class was very rough for me. But that was the message, quit playing in the dirt, come inside, go to school, read your textbooks, do your homework, forget that passion stuff that you're doing on the side. And I have to tell you this, I've learned more through CGIU, my commitment to action than I ever did in the actual coursework that I did. And now, since CGIU and getting the commitment off the ground, the university has me posing as their poster child, which is lovely, and I totally am accepting it and enjoy it, but they call all the time and say, hey, do you wanna come talk about your project? Hey, just so you know, we're putting this in the newsletter, or we have a recruiting event for international students, would you mind coming and talking about your garden? And it's the same people that literally told me, no, do not plant anything on this garden. We are, or you can't plant a garden. Don't put any, don't bring any dirt in. This is a horrible idea. You're gonna graduate in two years, and you're never gonna look back, and it's gonna turn into a weed plot that we have to take care of when you're gone. 10 years later, the garden is still thriving. It is growing every year. Um, so just be resilient. Yeah. Sounds like the university should be teaching a class on how to join the bandwagon. <laughs> so I'm gonna underscore what both of my co-panelists, Vinny and Brandon said, and I'm gonna add on another layer, which is a more explicit human face. Because you, you need that structure, that short, sweet, direct, you also need that persistence and that network of support, but also the emotion of it. And understanding that when folks are compelled by what's in here, that is going to move to action a lot more than if it's just in the ROI, right? You want the ROI. I, I'm not saying disregard what's there, but the heart. And I think that your generation and your dexterity with media and with these platforms allows for such a rich playground of how to reach the heart. I mean, you could do a 10 second video highlighting somebody who is your target of how your commitment to action is going to be transformational. A 30 second video, or maybe even if, if it's just a voiceover, what is that emotion that you can bring in? A picture. A picture's worth a thousand words. So I want you to remember that. And then I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna go to the piece of the follow-up. So you're doing that initial ask, maybe you get it, maybe you don't, and if you don't get it, you keep coming back. But it's the thoughtfulness of saying thank you. I know I'm, prob I'm the oldest one up here, so I'm gonna be the mom in the room. Make sure you say thank you. Preferably, especially if it's a gift that you're getting, $100, you write Vinny a handwritten thank you note. And in some cases, maybe you send a little token of appreciation. Because it's not a transactional thing that's happening. It's saying, I recognize your effort and I want you to know my appreciation for this, my appreciation for your mentorship time that you've taken from me, my appreciation for your investment, because this is about building relationships. We keep coming back to the idea of relationships. And this is how you cultivate it, not again, 
because it's you give me, I give you, it's because we are building a community and you show that community with a base of appreciation and trust. Thank you all, so much wisdom. And, and I'm just gonna sum up a couple points that you all said to make sure you can capture them. But the first is come in, make sure you know what you're gonna ask and make sure that you have your story and your pitch together of what you're trying to do in a very clear, concise way. The second that I'd say is don't be scared to share your personal story as part of what you're trying to do. Vinny, just hearing you talk about why you wanted to build a garden in and of itself exemplifies that principle. It's important. Don't be afraid to share that. Um, if someone says no, build a proof of concept, build a garden somewhere else, and then come back and say, look what I did, and look what I can do for you. Um, trust. Trust is important when you're asking for money, when you're building relationships. Having the CGIU brand is a build bi big builder of trust, right? I'll say on the Donors Choose platform, one builder of trust for us is proving that because we have thousands of requests from public school teachers on our site, proving that it's a real teacher that's asking for that money and that we have these measures of integrity, right? Um, so trust is huge in folks saying, um, even if they don't know exactly how that money is gonna be spent, that they understand what you're trying to do and you know, they know that you're gonna try to spend that money in a way that um, is in line with what you promised. And then I also wanna highlight personalization uh, as a part of this that Vicki, you highlighted where if somebody gave money towards something specific, call back to it, right? Call back to it, tell the story. What happened with that specific person they helped to support? Can you provide a photo in addition to that thank you note? And the more specific you can get with that personalization, that impact, the more people will believe that you're doing something great. Um, and the final thing I wanted to highlight was gratitude. Gratitude, huge. In addition to advice, gratitude, thank you for what you did. It made a huge difference. And that's part of building that relationship and showing what that's been able to you know, let you do, what the investment is, is letting you do, um, in addition to telling them that. So Vicki, I have another question for you because I know you do a lot of public speaking. And um, even I, I get nervous before I come up here and moderate a panel. I'm sure some of you are out there being like, oh man, if I gotta go ask somebody for money, like that's scary, right? So how do you address those nerves? How have you overcome them as you've gotten more experience with public speaking? I embrace it. If I were to tell you that I don't feel nervous at all every time I'm about to, to, to get on a stage and, 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 and speak publicly or you know sit in the chair and the camera's on and I'm about to go on air, that I didn't feel anything, I'd be lying to you. It's not true. But what I have learned over many years is to turn that nervousness into excitement, into like, this is, this is good nervousness, not dread nervousness. And it, it, it's also keeping your eye on the prize. Why am I doing this? Why am I up here, even though it means a little bit of nerves? Because I get to talk to you about something I believe in. I believe in public service. I believe in impact. And in reaching you, I'm able to do that. And if I let my nerves overcome me, I would never be able to engage with you. And the same with appearances in the media. So I think it is being okay with it. Nerves are normal, harnessing that, but having a larger goal in mind of why you're doing what you're doing. And I know all of you have that larger goal in mind. So think of that. Don't think of you know the camera that's right here in front of you. Can I no, add to that really quickly? Too. Oh, sorry. I love what you just said. And the one thing I think I try to remember is to enjoy the moment and that it's each opportunity. Even if you don't get your funding at your pitch, you learn something, maybe you get a little less nervous the next time, or you figure out something that you're gonna do better or differently the next time around. So just enjoy the moment, and I think it's a good reminder for all of us, because I'll, I'll tell you the truth, I'm a little nervous up here too. Oh, I was just saying, I think nerves just mean you care. And uh, I think to the point that you were making, if we're going through our lives and not feeling anything when we're going through whatever we're doing day to day, it probably means either we're not having new experiences or it means that we don't care a lot about whatever it is we're doing and maybe we need to reevaluate how we're spending our time. So nerves are definitely a good sign, not a bad one. And I think that I'll leave you with, you know, 
Um, it's not about being perfect. It's about being brave mm -hmm. and getting out there and doing the thing and saying the thing sometimes that feels really uncomfortable, which again is I think specific to fundraising, right? Just asking that question for the first time of, so how, you know, do you have any money to give to support this initiative? Is this something you'd be interested in investing in? Um, play around with the wording of that question that feels more comfortable to you, but then also don't be afraid to ask it, ask it directly. Um, so I'm curious, uh, you know, I'll start with, um, let's see, any of you actually can jump in on this one. I was curious what some of the issue areas are where you're seeing especially strong interest from investors and funders. Um, and really just for this group, as, especially as they think about crafting that pitch, what to talk about in today's specific world, what's, you know, um, where are the areas where you see the biggest opportunity and excitement from investors, from funders um, in supporting today? I can take this. I think I've been in a lot of these rooms where we've pitched for money, we've asked for money, and I've been on the other side of the table where I've been holding the purse strings, giving the money out. And I think one of the things that really makes an impact in those situations is passion and drive, right? So your idea might be okay, but are you passionate? Do you have the drive? Do you have the commitment to move it forward? And that's really important. And that really does translate in those pitches because I've also seen pitches where the idea was flawless. Um, the plan was flawless and the person comes in and you can tell they don't really care. They're not as passionate. They're not as committed. This is just something that they're doing to check the box till the next thing that they find. And for me, it's really ensuring that you're passionate. If you're not passionate about the project, find something that you are. Find your passion, and that's gonna help you because fundraising is so extremely hard. It is probably one of the hardest professions to go into because you're constantly being told no. And if you're not passionate about it, it's not gonna happen, and you're gonna get really discouraged as time goes on. So just keeping that in mind. Yeah, I think, I, I certainly agree, passion is incredibly important. I mean, people come on Shark Tank and do backflips and cartwheels and breathe fire and bring live animals on set that poop and all kinds of stuff to show, uh, to show how different or how, how much better their business is than, than someone else's. Uh, but something else uh, to the question, as you're thinking about being attractive to a funder, and this is, yes, um, specific to um, potentially an angel investor or, or some kind of equity investment, however, probably applies to other options as well. It's not just, I'm going to take this money and reach this milestone. It's articulating how that milestone will make you, your business, um, your company, um, your organization, your project attractive to the next round of investors or to the next grant program, or to the next government opportunity. So yes, it's important to reach the milestones and say, I'm going to do this set of things, I'm gonna take these steps over this period of time if I, if I get this injection of capital, but especially for an equity investment, we wanna know, okay, will the valuation for this company grow over time because that's how I, as an equity investor, will make money. It's, I own a percentage of this company, and if that percentage of the company increases in value, then I, you know, have more, then I have more money uh, after the investment than I did before. And so it's not just saying, I'm going to hit these milestones, but saying these milestones are then going to put me in position to be attractive to whatever that next round of capital is. And, and that's a more nuanced piece, but in something that is not always a part of, because it's not something that you might think about um, naturally as an entrepreneur, but something that's very important to articulate. You wanna know how the business, how the foundation, how the government, what's important to them, what are their metrics for success, and make sure that you are articulating those metrics, those pieces in your pitch and in your conversations about resourcing for whatever project you may be working on. Abby, I, I wanna come back to something I, I said in response to the very first question, and it was about what, what's the challenge that you're seeing, and I said that it was how do we measure DE&I? 
And I want to come back to the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because I think that as we think about our projects, it's a very important lens to bring. But it's important to be nuanced and intentional about it, and not just throw it into your grant proposal or throw it into your ask. But thinking about how that DEI lens relates to the impact of your project. So if we're talking about broadband in the South, then we're going to be talking about diversity in terms of the rural populations, right? Not just black and brown, but we're also talking about white folks. But the dimension of diversity is rural versus urban versus metropolitan, for example. So I, I want you to think about including that lens, remembering to measure it, and then thinking through how you can walk your potential funder through that. They may not know that there should be a DEI lens, but you can also serve as a teacher, as a guide, as a Sherpa in that and saying, I've got this great idea, and you're, and you're digging it, and a bonus onto that is that we're reaching maybe the, the elderly population, a population that you had not thought of. We're reaching a diversity in terms of age ranges, in terms of region, in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, you name it. But bring in that lens, even if it's not already there. And if you do, walk them through it. Great. And um, all of you, get your questions ready. You're going to be up next. It's my last one for the group. Uh, let's keep this one short, maybe two or three sentences on one piece of advice you'd offer to emerging entrepreneurs, these folks in the room today who want to get their big idea funded. For me, it's really about resiliency, right? People are gonna say no to you and they're gonna say no a lot, and that's okay. Those just aren't your people. So find the people that are gonna support you both with your commitment to action, your funding opportunities, but also those friends that are gonna support you and drive three hours to come watch you pitch or do something. Those are gonna be the best people for you to interact with, and remember to make the relationships in this room the people sitting next to you are working on similar projects and they are going to become your community. I'll tell you this, I still am in contact with people that I met in 2010 at CGIU and we're friends and lifelong friends and a lot of us mentor together now and I know that was way more than two or three sentences. It was probably a good paragraph, but there we go. Build out your toolkit. So a good idea is where you start, but that's not where you end. So figure out what it is that you need in terms of whether it's specialty knowledge, in terms of biotech, whether it's monitoring and evaluation, whether it's communication skills and how to engage with the community. You being here at CGIU, you're already building out that toolkit, but I'm gonna challenge you to further keep building out that toolkit. And I'm gonna be shameless here. And I'm gonna tell you that there is no other place that I would prefer you to build out that toolkit than with me at the Clinton School of Public Service. I would love to see all of you there. But if not, figure out what track, what resources you can appeal to and engage with to build out that toolkit of impact. I think everything that we've discussed here, everything about funding really begins with you. So for all of you, it's important that you see value in yourself before you see value in anything that you're creating. And so there are a lot of ways to do affirmations, but a simple one could be just looking in the mirror and saying, hey, I'm valuable. Whatever I'm creating is valuable. And so when I'm going into these conversations with potential funders, I'm trading value for value. I have an incredible idea that has the potential to change the world, and they have resources that are connected to metrics um, that they need to meet that only big and great ideas like the one that I have can help them meet. And so you're valuable. Everything that you're working on is valuable. And remember that as you're going into these conversations and that hopefully will set you up for success. Yes, if you don't believe in your own idea, nobody else will. All right, y'all, let's open it up for some questions from the audience. You are speedy, so, so you, <laughs> you get to go first. They're gonna bring you a microphone, so just hold on for one second over here. 
Thank you. Uh, before I give my question, I just want to say thanks. This is really um, the first time I've had the opportunity to hear from people in the field, people who know so much about this topic. And it, it really means a lot as somebody who's been working for the past two years to try to get their initiative up and running. And, and on that note, um, for the past two years, I started working on a program that, I, um, that matters to me a lot. And I've had my fair share of digging into my piggy bank, burning my wallet on the implementation, the ideation, and really having the proof of concept down packed, which I think I have. So now I'm at the scaling point, and so I feel if there's any point that I'm going to need to fundraise, it's now. The caveat is that I'm trying to build a nonprofit. So whenever I'm constructing my pitches, I'm having a really hard time walking that thin line between pitching it as an investment and pitching it as an impact project. And I know that investors are going to be inter interested in the profits that are gained from it, but I really view this as something that is impactful. And there is ways for me to spin this as something that is an objectively good investment but that's not the way that I think of it. And I'm wondering what you all think about this, how if I need money to scale this project, I should pitch it if it's something that I feel is, should be thought of for the impact. The audience is going to drive how you pitch. So if, if you're looking at an investor that's looking purely for the ROI, then your pitch is going to be different. And I've talked to this guy to, to help you figure out how to craft that pitch. If you're doing a pitch to a foundation, to you know the, the, the state foundation, let's say you live in California, the California Community Foundation, that pitch is going to be different. It's going to be a lot more broader. It's going to be about return on investment, but for the public good. So I think that with any message and with any pitch, it is who is that audience. Within those two buckets, then you're, you're going to parse out that pitch depending on what flavor that organization is. But it always starts with audience. Thank you. Yeah, I'll add one more thing to that, which is try things out and see what works. So go in with a hypothesis that relates to the goals of the investor that you're talking to, but then debrief for yourself about what went well, what didn't, what landed, what do you want to try next time, and how are you going to adapt that pitch the next time around to make it even better. All right, let's jump in with hands up. Over here. Um, thank you so much. It's a privilege to meet you. I'm Catherine from in Ghana, schooling in Costa Rica. So um, my project is about early child education, and it's a nonprofit and we are not expecting to make any money. So then how do I pitch to get um, money or funding to sustain it if we don't have, um, we are not going to be making any money. So then how do we sustain our project um, with investors or people willing to donate to us? I think that's a really great question and that's probably the situation that a lot of you are in, right? You're not planning to make money from your commitment. It is just for social good. I think number one is really figuring out your budget. So a lot of times what I like for our students to be able to do is how much money do you actually need? What is the bare minimum that's gonna help you achieve your goals and your mission? And start from there. A lot of times we see students will not work on their project until they, oh I need $100,000, I need a million dollars, I need two million dollars before I can get started. And as we dig deeper and we create budgets and we create plans, I like to have a high, medium, and low. What's the absolute lowest amount that you can work with and still make an impact? And then what's your dream, right? So is it $2 million? And if you get that, it's gonna be the best scenario and you can do everything? Um, great, not a lot of us are gonna get $2 million. And really focus on what you can do with the very least, but also who can you partner with? Are there other organizations that are in your area doing similar work that have resources that can be shared? whether it's printers or teachers, or in my case, shovels and garden equipment, could I go borrow them from somewhere instead of having to purchase them? And doing it vice versa, right? So who else can you help with the resources that you have? And you'll find that you can actually make a really big impact with a, not a lot of money. I know we're talking about fundraising today, but I think for our commitments to action as CGIU students, it's really important to know you can still make an impact without a lot of money and keep that in mind as you move forward. I may have a, a bit of a divergent opinion. I, I, I think whether it's for-profit or non-profit, if the goal is to drive impact over time and to be sustainable, I think everyone should be looking at having some kind of revenue generating vertical as part of your project. Now, that doesn't have to cover um, all of the operating costs for your project, but even the uh, 
practice, um, even the activity of going through and thinking about what pieces of this could generate revenue would be helpful, I've, I've found to be helpful um, from a business standpoint and for nonprofit organizations that I've worked with, I've found it to be helpful as well. And I think that a direct answer to your question is you just have to articulate the things that are important to the funders that you're looking at because all of them are gonna have metrics um, tied um, to uh, their distribution of capital, things that they wanna put into their annual report, et cetera, include those pieces in your pitch and that, that can certainly help to, uh, to, to buttress a, a, a pitch that's focused directly on impact. And you know what, he brought up a great point that reminded me of something. I have seen a lot of and worked with a lot of different programs that have been able to monetize their nonprofit work and social impact. One of them was actually an orphanage in India where the people who led the orphanage spoke English and they spoke English very well and they were teaching all the orphans how to speak English. And that alone skill set was huge in the area that they were in, the south of India. So actually the orphans became tutors um, once they were age of 13 or 14 to local community members. And that helped them generate income and a revenue stream. So yeah, being able to monetize what you have is important too. I agree with both what you said. One thing I'll say, donors choose the way it works is every time someone makes a donation, 15% of that goes to the operations of the organization which pads towards self-sustainability. So it could be a revenue stream in the sense of taking um, the competencies and turning it into a new business line, but it could also just be in the way that you build the structure of how you're raising money that you know with each contribution, with each donation, that um, you're taking a lean, hopefully, percentage towards the organization so you can make the greatest impact on your constituents, but that you're building that into your model, um, even if it's a nonprofit, and that you're building the programs and relationships for folks to commit to maybe not just one year donation, but you know, two year, three year donation, even up front, if that's something that you can do. Um, okay, we'll take one more question and then we're gonna ask a brave soul to come up here if someone's interested and share a quick pitch on what they're trying to do and, and we'll give some feedback on that pitch. So one more question in the room um, and I'll, I'll choose this, this uh, person in front. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this. Um, so I also have my own nonprofit, and I must admit this is from personal experience. <laughs> but my question is that what if you do have a theory of change? You have like a, a method uh, that's not been tried before, and you take that to ground. You build the relationship. You get the money going, and then it doesn't just have the impact that you wanted. So that's the first impasse, right? Like just a fail. I don't want to call it failed, but like, yeah, like just something that didn't uh, deliver what it promised. Uh, from a relationship perspective with the donor, how do you move forward from that point and make sure that they like stay with you, stay in the rhythm and innovate with you in a way? Transparency is key to any relationship and it's in the good times and in the bad times and in fact, I think that your transparency would be much appreciated by the donor. Uh, and also, I, I would encourage you to zoom out and help walk the donor through the fact that, you know, in the scientific method, not all hypotheses are proven true, but that in order to find, you know, a solution, to find the best method, you do have to go through trial and error, and that you appreciate their investment in that what did you learn from, again, not the failure, but the fact that the hypothesis wasn't proven, and what are you going to do going forward? I can't guarantee you that this funder is gonna say, okay, yes, I'm sticking with you. I can't, but you have learned a tremendous amount from this, so whatever happens with the donor, you have learned, take that information in, and I would hope that with your transparency and walking that donor through, you would be able to recalibrate and reboot that relationship. Hi. Is there somebody who's interested in coming up here? Oh my goodness, I don't know how to we choose. Need our own first. shark tank, CGIU. <laughs> um, all right, I think that, I think you might have been first. I don't know, it's hard to tell, but jump up here. Let's hear, okay, round of applause. <laughs> Member of CGI University. All right. Make it a, a quick pitch, and then folks can add some feedback. Come on up here. Here, I'll put uh, I'll put ninety seconds on the on <laughs> the clock here. This is a real here. Shark Tank experience. Okay, 
I'll give you my mic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm Jazz Shahal from the University of Virginia. I want to walk you guys through a familiar scenario a lot of you probably experienced. Let's say you're in the doctor's office, you get your blood work back, your cholesterol is high, your BMI is a little high after Christmas, you know, your glucose is high, and the doctor tells you, well, you got to eat healthier, you got to lose weight. And then you think to yourself, you told me this last year, I've been doing the same thing, it's still not working, right? And now you're kind of worried, you're at risk of, you know, developing chronic illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure. Once you get to this point, there's no going back, right? Only medication is the only answer. So what preventive measures can you take? You look online, all this misinformation, all this stuff that you have to keep looking forward to, and there's nothing that actually can you resonate with. But, you know, you decide, I'll buy a fitness watch, like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or a Garmin, all these fitness gadgets, maybe that'll help me stay on track and lose weight or get healthier. But you don't know what actual, you get the data back from your watch, you don't know what actions to take, right? There's no actionable feedback, no insights. So what we did at Follow Up Health is we took all the data from all those watches, you create a profile with our application, and we give you guys, we provide actionable, actionable feedback every single day on real actions you can take on how you can actually improve your health. What steps can I take? What food is the best for my health? What food is the best for my medication? What are the actual steps that I can take? And how can we share that data with your physician so they can actually stay with you throughout the entire cycle of you going on your treatment plan? And how can we actually improve your health and really take this, these insights from your Apple Watches, from your Garmin Watches, from your Fitbits, and provide real insight based on that data? All right. Woo. Uh, thanks for getting up here. Jump in. Uh, so I think, well, I'll, I'll let you guys start. <laughs> You're ready. You're ready. I, yeah, I loved your excitement yes. and your passion. And the fact that you just jumped up here is so brave. And I want to commend you on that. And first and foremost, thank you, thank you. I absolutely loved learning about your project. I think that conciseness could have been, yeah, a l I know, and you did it right on the spot. Embrace it. You did it right on the spot. So I think it was fantastic. But just being a little more concise would have been a little helpful for me. I would have liked to see a human face a story, an anecdote. My father or this person, they suffered from this and this is something that could have helped them emotion, human face, in addition to conciseness. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, having a story, either you being frustrated because you weren't getting the kind of data that you wanted from your watch or asking everyone in the room who has a Fitbit or who has a smartwatch to raise their hand and then asking, are you happy with the data that you get or do you feel like it's actually useful for, from a medical standpoint? Um, maybe a good place to start, but happy to talk about more of that off, offline. Um, the last thing for me is just, we'd love to hear what ask you have. Yeah, I can give you a quick ask. My ask to you guys is, what type of information do you guys feel like would be the most beneficial for your health, right? I think a lot of people in this room we all struggle with making like right decisions. So what's that barrier that's coming and actually helping you guys? But my biggest ask would be for the panelists, would you guys be interested in mentoring me for 0% equity? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Of course. Yeah. Great job. <laughs> great job. Yeah. One, one additional round of applause, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Great to meet you. Nice Thank you. you. Thank you for coming up. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add just very quickly, the pitch was right at about uh, a minute, 40 seconds. And so that 90 seconds is a lot longer than you probably think it is. You can fit a lot more information into that short period of time uh, than maybe you would have imagined when you first heard me say 90 seconds. So if you can do it in that 90 seconds, then uh, you can set yourself up to be able to do it you know, for any other length of time as well. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to close us out. Thank you all. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> really great advice. And I'll sum up a couple things that we talked about. You know, if you're going to start your journey here, right? Work on something that you believe in, that you're passionate about, and believe in yourself, and let that come through when you're talking to folks. Do your research, right? Do that research to see what's out there, who might care about what you care about, what foundations exist in that space. Be direct and transparent in your asks and in your follow-up. And ask for something. Make that final ask. Uh, make sure you don't leave that meeting without a next step 
with the person that you're talking to. So thank you all for coming today. We, we really appreciate it and hope you got some good tidbits about fundraising. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. Hey, one final thing. Uh, if you uh, follow me on Twitter, just go to Twitter. Um, Brandon Talk is the username. I'm going to put a list and I'll tag CGIU 2023 of funding opportunities that I'm aware of that might be relevant. So for those of you that have something and want to apply immediately, um, take a look at that again at Brandon Talk on Twitter and, and hopefully that'll be helpful. I'm not as tech savvy as Brandon, but I'm going to be here in the back of the room. I've got information for you. Would love to be in touch. Would love to support all of you. And I'm one of the CGIU mentors, so I do want to make sure that you guys all connect with me. Um, you guys will get my contact information eventually, or you can follow me on LinkedIn. It's Vinny Joel or Instagram. I will probably respond faster on Instagram, to be honest with you. But I would love to help you guys create funding maps and really look at where can you find funds. Thank you. Thank you all. Awesome.